Now let me go deeper into why taking Kronos out of an agreement or a contract has such deep social ramifications and also ramifications for the destruction of the environment. So environmental protection is built into removing Kronos from a contract. It's not easy to see why. But I'll try my best to, to explain it to you. The problem is it's so broad reaching and our, our thinking is so fundamentally upside down. I have to really blow away uh, a lifetime of indoctrination, of false indoctrination that they've put in you to, to see, uh, really to just begin to understand why this is so, so necessary. But let me, let me start by, by just going a bit deeper into Kairos and Kronos. So Kairos, as I mentioned, is very close to risk. So a lot of the point of this Kronos versus Kairos is really predictability. That's the fake certainty of Kronos, this regular paycheck, regular meals, this regular regularity that uh, invites parasites. In other words, the whole capitalist system is parasitic. So regular uh, returns invite parasitism. Now, Kairos in a lot of ways resembles risk. Nature's unreliable. Nature's unpredictable. Nature's complex. And so it implies that there's a risk burden with Kairos. It also means that freedom is risky. You're only free in nature. You can't be free if you're taxed. And you get taxed if you have anything that basically, if the uh, treadmill spins, if you're on that hamster wheel and it spins regularly, then it can be exploited. And in, uh, in some ways, it's, it's a parasitic oscillation. So what these people are, are doing with unearned income uh, is doing pretty much what you see in nature as well. You have a cycle in nature, the cycles all over nature. And what that allows, if they're regular enough, it allows some meta cycles to form on the top, parasitic cycles. So all the unfairness in the capitalist system, the, the rontiers, the parasites, uh, all the exploiters, um, the tyrants, uh, the totalitarians, they're all exploiting the regularity in the system. And they're avoiding the risk. So freedom means taking on risk now. People are generally risk averse. They bought easily with Kronos. Now let me explain what I mean by that. You're being won by honest trifles like a regular meal to betray you in deepest consequence by really exposing you to all the risk. So le let me give you an example from history. So for example, say in the Royal Navy. So the Royal Navy, it wasn't quite all the time where they press ganged you into the Royal Navy and it was a miserable place uh, below deck where you probably died of scurvy or died in some war somewhere, um, you know, imperialist, uh, pointless war. Actually, people really wanted to get into the Navy for most of its history and the reason was that they gave you regular meals. So, regular meals, the idea that, oh, this dream, not that you get fed, but you get fed on a regular rotation. If you're used to hunger, if you're used to freedom, if you're used to unpredictability of where your next meal is coming from, which is largely how it is in nature, then you're easily seduced by the dream that you could have this regular beat of being fed with a regular meal. So, the meals were probably not much better than the average person had in Britain on the streets. But a lot of people signed up to the Royal Navy because they were regular. So food throughout the history of civilization has been weaponized. Frederick Douglass, the former slave <clears throat> and turned author, who wrote a lot about slavery in America, mentioned how food has been weaponized in the slave industry. So the idea of giving you a regular meal means that you sacrifice your freedom and it doesn't ever work out. You're being shortchanged. 
Think of those people in the Royal Navy. They paid a very, very high price for that regular meal. Once they were in the, the Royal Navy and they were out at sea, they had no options. If they rebelled, they would be hung. And they were very likely to risk life and limb in some pointless war somewhere, or far more likely to get scurvy. Now, scurvy had a higher attrition rate than, than war for most of the existence of the Royal Navy. And actually, the commanders of the Royal Navy actually uh, preferred it that way, uh, because it kept the people, or rather the sailors, docile. And the same happened on plantations. By giving slaves regular meals, they could almost get them to buy into slavery. The same has happened to you in this corporate world. Just giving you a regular salary on a regular basis means that you'll give up uh, all the risk premium. And it'll mean that you can be exploited. You're being short-changed on the deal. But the idea of having this chronological regularity, in other words, the reduction of risk, is so high that people will take this false bargain. So in other words, think of it this way. Nature is a lottery that pays off higher than regularity. But people opt for the regularity rather than taking their chances with freedom and nature because they would prefer certainty to uncertainty even if they had a loss to take certainty. One of the most depressing things I ever read about the Holocaust, about the death camps that were labor camps that became death camps, the depressing thing about them was when the Nazis left, when the SS guards and all the kapos fled, when the advancing Russian army was approaching, they had to leave, of course, because they knew they were going to face the consequences of what they'd done in the death camps. So they left en masse and left the gates open of the concentration camps. The Allied armies arrived about four days after the guards had left. And amazingly, all the prisoners were there in place. The reason is they were waiting for their meals. The gates were open, they had freedom, and they didn't want Kairos. They wanted Kronos. So any one of those pictures that you see of emaciated people in those camps, subtract at least four days from those skeletons in terms of nutrition. They did it to themselves because they wanted a regular meal. They wanted Kronos. Now have a look at this graph. It shows how people have sold out their liberty for security. And they've got neither, and they deserve neither. So this is Google's Ngram viewer. If you have a look at how many times the word liberty is mentioned as opposed to these other forms of reference or indirect references to security, this graph is a nightmare for a libertarian. You can see what people have done. They've become more and more concerned about safety, regularity, chronos, and less and less concerned about kairos and liberty. Why? Because they've sold out on risk and they've been shortchanged. We've all been shortchanged by Kronos because the exploitation under Kronos is certain. Death and taxes are certain, but we opt for certainty as opposed to unpredictability, even though unpredictability pays off better. So part of reducing our CO2 emissions is getting more Kairos into the system. More risk. We have to. Why? Because we have no choice. Kairos is our future. We are going into an environment of instability. If you have a look at all the time period since the Younger Dryas, in other words, the time since agriculture and don't forget that agriculture is trying to extract a regular output from Mother Nature. So in other words, square field farming, geometric farming, is the idea that you can in use the seasons to enforce a regular crop on clockwork. And if you can do that, then basically you can start all these other parasitic cycles 
that really feed off that primary cycle. And you can go all the way up until you get these bullshit jobs, which people commute back and forward to on a regular cycle. They're basically regular cycles that are based on the success of the regular cycle of agriculture. Don't forget, agriculture didn't come first. It was the city, the demand for a regular payout from nature. Um, so it's really their version of um, renewable energy. It's like trying to get a regular renewable output of energy from nature. That's why agricultural started. And it did that to service the regular celestial sidereal uh, festivals that were really religious in nature. So the city was the first cycle. So don't, don't get that upside down. But anyway, go back to the video and go back to Tappy, um, video number five, if you're more interested in that. So anyway, the problem is that we had an extensive time of regular temperatures. So it was unprecedented in the climatological record. Such a long period of stable fluctuations and regularity in the climate had never been seen before. So the previous climates and temperatures were very erratic. It would have been impossible to do farming in most other eras. And then you have this long era of stability. We come into the end of that era of stability. We can no longer extract Kairos. When you're looking now at the floods in the Midwest, when you're looking at the tornadoes, uh, when you're looking at droughts in, say, Australia, you're seeing how the climate is becoming unstable. What we've done is not so much heated up the planet, we've destabilized the planet. And so we are looking at a period of Kairos, we're looking at irregularity. Now if we try and cling on to Kronos, we try and extract regularity out of this increasingly volatile environment, we're going to get hurt and hurt badly. We need to get to systems that are built for Kairos, that are built for irregularity. In other words, that are robust, that can take risk. A mass production system and a mass distribution of food cannot be sustained in an unpredictable environment. And that's what we've just seen in the Midwest. So what you saw was the farmers lost 30% of their crop. Why? They were trying to time the market. Because of the tariff wars, the market uh, was depressed. So they thought they would store their grain and then time the market. In other words, try and extract some regularity. They were trying to hedge against the depressed market. They got caught out because the flooding destroyed the silos. They lost a significant part of their crop and hence they've lost some of our food security in America. Now that's going to happen again and again and again because we have a mass production and mass distribution system. It's brittle. We need to get it more local. Things like Victory Gardens are far more robust because when they fail, they fail locally. We're not trying to extract a massively um, chronological and cyclical uh, oscillator. We're just trying to get feed, us, feed off an oscillator. The oscillator is going chaotic, so we cannot do that anymore. So we need to prepare for that, and that's part of, uh, part of taking time out of contracts is a way to force the system into being more prone to Kairos and, and friendly to Kairos, in other words, more uh, robust, more resilient to risk. And we're facing significant risks. We can't go back now. You see, people have made a big mistake looking at these trends in the graph. So we're tr looking at trends where how the temperature is trending, how the CO2 is trending. This is awfully dangerous. Because it's not the trends that get the frog that's being uh, cooked in the saucepan. It's the fluctuations. So the system has been perturbed. And it's been perturbed chaotically. The weather is going crazy. So it's not the fact that the sea level rises. Forget about sea level rise. It's unimportant. What is important is that the volatility of the climate is getting more and more extreme. Now that's serious because once you perturb a system, if you imagine a spinning top, you can always spin up a top, but once it's been perturbed and is starting to go chaotic and starting to oscillate in a chaotic regime, 
it's almost impossible to bring it back into a stable regime. Now that's the danger of the climate. That's the danger of the tipping points. It's not that we're tipping over into a feedback cycle that now enters runaway. It means that those feedback cycles introduce chaos into the system. You cannot make a good living of a random number generator, and we've turned the environment into a random number generator. Now that's happened today. So forget about 2100 and what the risks at 2050. It's not something that, oh, we wake up in 2050 and say, whoops, oh, climate change starts today. Climate instability has been around for more than a decade now, and that's the problem. So think of it this way. It doesn't matter that you have an escalating climate, whether it's 1.5 degrees, whether it's 2 degrees. Crops can survive 1 degree. You can have a whole summer that's 1 degree hotter in America, and you'll probably have a bumper crop. Have one day with an extreme temperature, and you've lost the entire crop. Have one day with a flood, you've lost the entire crop. Now, you might get the crops back again the next season, but you don't know. There's risk. So you can't have really this mass of people living off regular agriculture if one year you have a bumper crop and the next year you have no crop at all. That bumpy ride, that volatility, is impossible to live off. It's impossible for 7.7 .7 billion people to live off basically this system that's chaotic. So the fact that you look on a graph and say, yeah, some years we have good years and some years we have bad years, but overall it evens out. Say, no, it doesn't. It's really important about the volatility. What we should be looking at is a volatility index of the climate. So as we put more heat in it, is another way of saying we put more energy into it. And what that means is we should be looking at how that makes it more unpredictable, more volatile, more crazy. And that's what's going to get us. So it's the extremes of temperature. It's the extremes of, of weather. Um, it's flooding. It's heat. Uh, it's environmental destruction. It's the extremes of... of uh, so it's, it's not a question of, oh, this little cute animal went extinct. Well, check them off the list. And then you go, well, we're marking down the list at this certain rate. No, it doesn't work like that. The food web has preferential nodes in it. And you'll take out one of those nodes, for example, some insect that you probably never thought was important. Um, maybe it's the bee, maybe it's a certain bird, maybe it's cyanobacteria, maybe it's something that's a uh, krill in the sea. You, you're not really absolutely sure what one of these preferential nodes is. But a single heat event could take out that node. And that wouldn't be like the fruit bat going extinct or basically the golden toad going extinct, which is probably not a preferential node, this would be a key node in the environmental system. And in the ecosystem would break down extensively when you got this one hole in a preferential node in the food network. And so it's another way of saying we're entering a time of kairos. And we need to, instead of say, oh, we need to be carbon net neutral by some arbitrary date or anything like that, that's an unrealistic goal. What you're really trying to do is hang on to certainty. Instead of saying we need to give up on certainty. And for our survival, we need to now embrace Kairos. So all of these ideas are largely to move the system over so we can then start to um, embrace risk. The casualties of all of this are anybody that's been trying to make a living out of regularity. Sorry, your game is over. The capitalist game, the banking system, the financial system, it's over. You can make this less painful if you do it deliberately by a change to the law. And then simply just take the time component out of contracts and it'll do it. The pain is going to be really severe for some people, but not as severe as you think. The people that will be most impacted are the people that can afford to be impacted. In other words, the rich. So in other words, if you take out the linear time component, take Kronos out of context, one of the things that will implode immediately is the 1.5 quadrillion in derivative instruments. All derivative instruments have a date component in it. In some term or some respect, they have a time component. So all that paper would be automatically invalidated at a stroke with that law. That's a good thing. 
doesn't look obvious that it's a good thing to cause a financial collapse like that. But that financial collapse would mean that the finance industry, as much as it could be rebuilt, would be rebuilt without a time component. Now think in terms of, say, the insurance industry, I've given you an example of how that can survive. You can structure insurance so that you mention Kairos instead of Kronos. So in other words, you mention an event that's unpredictable would be acceptable in a contract. So for example, end of life. So insurance is still possible. You can still hedge against risk with insurance. It wouldn't be easy to extract a premium, as I mentioned. Now think of other instruments, say debt instruments. You can't extract a regular payment of interest. You wouldn't be able to specify interest because there would be a time component in it. You could still lend. It would be possible to do venture capital, but only if you share the risk. So, in other words, instead of giving you a loan, a bank would have to be a venture capitalist. They would have to ask, what's the venture? What do you want to use this money for? And then they would have to give you that money. It would imply that they have to get an equity holding in your venture. So because they couldn't extract interest, in other words, they couldn't basically shove the risk onto you and then hold you by the law, by Kronos, by saying you haven't paid the interest, therefore you're in default. And you say, well, shit happens. Kairos got me by the throat. My enterprise didn't work. And they say, that's not my business. You handle Kairos. I handle Kronos. That's the game that the banks have been playing, and it's, it's an unfair game. So what would happen if you wanted to be a banker? You would have to say, look, I'll, I'll give you this money, um, and then there's some way that I get a return. That return would be a dividend. There's nothing wrong with getting a dividend if that money was put to good use. You could share in the results. You couldn't share in an arbitrary result, which is a percentage rate. Now you could say, well, I'll, I'll loan you this money. You have to pay it back. Can't say when. I could say it must be returned, by, say, on the date of your death. That would be fine because that's uh, an unpredictable date. But I could say to you, well, I want 6% in interest. So I can't say when you pay it back, but I can say this. When you pay it back, you have to pay it back plus 6%. Why would anybody pay it back? Well, the reason is that you could say, if you give it at back this money back at 6% interest, then I will extend you double that amount at 3% interest or at 6% interest. In other words, you could predicate the payback of the money on an increase in the loan. So all of these things make banking possible, but fair. Fractional reserve banking would, would be utterly impossible because you couldn't extend credit to people in this exploitative, um, synchronistic, chrono chronological, linear time, chronos way. Okay, so overall I've explained to you how parasitism is closely related to chronos. Slavery is closely related to chronos. And to make a fairer society, to make a society that's less efficient, the goal is less efficiency, okay? We want a less efficient environment. A less efficient environment consumes less, and it's more robust. And that's where we need to be headed. Think of it as the slow food movement in France, as I said, away from fast food in America. So fast food is junk food. Slow food is better food. Uh, ultimately, it's cheaper and it supports more people, uh, but it takes more time. So we need to get out of this idea that time is money and think in terms of time is freedom. Time is freedom if your time is kairos. Time is slavery and money is slavery. That's Kronos. Now, there's one more thing to add. How do you pay out the parasites now that would need to be supported? The armies of parasites. The system has generated this genocide of parasites. It's an unhealthy uh, system. The capitalist system is a horrendously unhealthy beast. Uh, it's made us into really a lousy animal. An animal full of parasites, ticks, bloodsuckers. So 
those blood suckers will actually have to be cared for in some way or another. And so there's one more change to the law to pay for, say, a universal basic income. And that's a machine tax. So machines in general are chronos. They're chronological. I show me any machine, I will show you that it has a regular cycle. That's what machines were all about, is to take something like oil, uh, which is, in other words, dammed up energy from past epochs, to take that dammed up energy, sunlight that was once irregular, it's been buffered in a battery in oil and coal, you take that and burn it on a cycle, a turbine or a reciprocating engine. There's some uh, reciprocation, there's some oscillation, and that's how you get regular movement. You get a car out of that, because you take something that's irregular, which was sunlight in past epochs, and you turn it into motion in the 20th century, and that's what an internal combustion engine is doing, and that's what a jet engine is doing. Um, that's what the move from sail to steam was a move away from Kairos, uh, very cheap energy, almost free energy. Uh, the cost of a sail is all that it takes for you to extract movement, uh, but you cannot predict the time of the movement. You cannot predict when the wind blows. So the move to steam was to make uh, ocean travel more predictable. Uh, to do that, then basically you could have more and more parasitic cycles that fed off uh, maritime trade. And that's the story all the way through. Now, a machine tax would make Kronos pay for its exploitation. And that implies that clocks, machines, computers, uh, anything that was based on Kronos would be taxed. It would be easy to tax because there isn't a machine that's been invented that didn't really replace uh, human labor. So we think of, uh, if you don't actually know about robotics and you don't actually know about automation and computing, then you commonly think, well, they make a robot that does this fantastic new thing, you know, it rolls cigarettes or it does some makes this automated widget or something. You say, no, that's not the way it works. Automation is making a manual process more efficient. So if you go back in history, you'll find that the person that made the machine, they analyzed the workers that were doing it. They, there's guys like Taylor. They broke down all the tasks. The reason they broke them down is that they could steal the knowledge um, away from the experts, in other words, the skilled labor, they could take that knowledge, they could make a machine out of it, they could make it chronological, they could make it automated. And they examined what the skilled worker was doing, broke it down into repetitive tasks that then they could uh, automate. So you can always find, uh, no matter what process it is, you could f say, what would that be? How many people would it take? And essentially how much would they be paid on this uh, wage slavery system that we have now? And you say, well, how much labor, skilled or otherwise, were they replacing? And that's pretty easy to find out. And you say, well, that machine must pay the Social Security that's not being paid because the machine does not get a regular salary. So in the transition from skilled labor or unskilled labor to a machine, in other words, to automation, what you took out of the equation was the fact that you had to pay um, this wage slave his wage slave salary. So you had to pay the worker for his time. So you no longer have to pay the worker for the time. You just need to pay the machine maintenance, and that's what mechanization and automation was, was all about. So that was done without a tax. What the Luddites should have done was insisted on a penny tax on the cotton gins. They could have relied on the fact that greedy politicians then would have, you know, pushed and pushed that tax higher and higher as they, you know, exploited the, uh, the weavers more and more um, in, in terms of cotton merchants more and more. You can always trust politicians to raise taxes. So all the Luddites should have done was made a penny tax on gin mills, um, on the cotton gin. And 
that would have translated really the Jacquard mill translated into the computer and computers when they were automated would have also had to pay that tax and uh, unfortunately in the oversight they just tried to break the machines which was really counterproductive because they were using violence against the machines and the system used violence against the Luddites and so the machines went ahead and replaced all the workers. Really what uh, we should have done is just said the workers should be sharing in the machine dividend. So, and the best way to do that is to, to say there's a machine tax and you work it out as the equivalent social security and state and local taxes and federal taxes that an, an employee now is not paying because you replaced them with an automated process. And that's, that's simply how it would be. Then that money filters back into a UBI and then it means that the machine dividend, the means of production that so obsessed the communists and Marx was um, all it means is you just need to share in the machine dividend, in the automation dividend. And it means that then people have free time. They have Kairos free time, not Kronos free time. And in, the, in that way, you distribute wealth because you distribute time. Time is money. Time is freedom. So you distribute wealth and freedom in this way. Now, to a classic economist, this looks like a poorer society because they're just looking at chronological efficiency they just have been looking at this growth industry and so they're looking at it in terms of a chicken in every pot and they're not looking at the fact that now it's got to be a chlorinated chicken and eventually it'll be a genetically engineered chicken and it's becoming more and more of a junk chicken in the pot as we pursue efficiency economists god of efficiency is entropy what they're introducing with efficiency is, is basically a higher velocity of the system, but that high velocity system is a lower standard of living. It's a lower quality. So high velocity, lower quality is something that they've ignored. And so our metric for things like GDP and the economy says how fast is the velocity of a dollar? Now in this system, what I'm saying, if you remove the time component, if you move it towards Kairos, the velocity of, of the dollar gets slower and slower. It's a good thing. It's a recession with a smile on its face. It's a recession where you don't get laid off in panic because you now don't have a regular income. You get laid off to a universal basic income that comes from a machine tax. You really literally get more time to spend with the wife and kids. And it's not a fake thing anymore. It's not a euphemism for, oh, I'm screwed. It means that grandma doesn't need to be put into a home. It means you can have grandma at home, and it means she can take care of the kids, so you can go out fishing. Now, people that are out fishing would not be unemployed. They might be actually sustaining their family in an environment where there's far less consumption and far less mass production and mass consumption. So this is recession with a kind face. And I hope I've got through to you with this idea that we've got up shit creek because we've worshipped Kronos. We've worshipped Kronos all the way right through into the religions. That God in the sky, the guy with the big white beard, with the scythe, he's Kronos. Don't worship him. He's Satan. He's Saturn. <laughs> Worship risk. Worship the devil. Worship unpredictability. The wages of sin are far better than the wages of predictability. Ask Frederick Douglass. Ask the people in the labor camps that turned into death camps. Ask them about the wages of regularity. The wages of irregularity are the wages of death. The wages of unpredictability are robust, resilient. They pay better. They have higher risk. They're the wages of Kairos. And that's what we need to move to. So there's only one demand. Take time. The time component must be removed from every single agreement and contract. Otherwise, it's unenforceable by the law. So in other words, you cannot use the violence of the law to enforce Kronos. That's the way we get social equality, we get reduced impact on environmental destruction, and that's the way we get more social equality and higher quality of life.
give it some thought.